Good afternoon. As chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I'd like to welcome you to our fifth program of the winter quarter. Today's speaker is an author, teacher, and outstanding spokesman of the Jewish people. Born in Transylvanian town of Siget in Hungary, he was a teenage survivor of Auschwitz and Buchenwald. After liberation, he slowly fought his way back to sanity in Paris. Mr. Wiesel's accomplishments include such novels as The Town Down the Wall, The Age of the Forest, The Jews in Silence, and many more. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce a great Jew, Mr. Eli Wiesel. Brandeis is here. <laughs> I had always hoped to be introduced in a different way. I had hoped that you would say, this gentleman is not Irving Clifford. <laughs> he is not even Howard Hughes. <laughs> All I know about this meeting today really is that it must end before one o'clock. So it will end before one o'clock. Two, usually, when I do have encounters with young people, I try to answer questions, which is unusual for me. Because I believe your questions are probably as good as mine, and mine are as good as yours, so we shall try and exchange questions. But since most of you don't even know what questions to ask, <laughs> I'll start by telling you a few stories. Once upon a time, there was a Hasidic master. Don't ask me what Hasidism is, because now it's not a time to tell you jokes about Hasidism. <laughs> a Hasidic master named Rabbi Moshe Leip of Sasov. He was a great man, wise, innocent, innocent in the medieval sense of the word, a kind of fool who believed in fervor, in beauty, in the word, in the tale. And once he said, what love really means, I learned not from my... No, my... <laughs> How is it? Yeah. What love really means, I learned not from my teachers, not even from my books, not even from my friends. I learned it in an inn, in a cabaret, you would say today, except there were no cabarets then. In an inn from two drunkards. I came into that inn one evening and I saw two peasants, drunk, speaking to each other. And one says, Alexei. Do you love me? And the other said, Ivan, of course I love you. I'm your friend. They drank vodka. Five minutes later, or five glasses later, Alexei, do you love me? Ivan, naturally I love you. I'm your friend. Few glasses vodka more. Alexei, do you love me? But Ivan, he got angry. How many times do I have to tell you? I do love you. And then Ivan said, but Alexei, if you love me, how come that you don't know what hurts me? This Hasidic story has many meanings. One may be construed as a commercial for the alcohol industry. <laughs> <laughs> Two, it must mean that the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. Three, that you can learn certain truths, certain wisdom, not in schools, but in inns, after you go to school. But this is actually the entire concept of Hasidism, that man who lives in the universe, who lives in the middle of creation, who is the very heart of creation, 
Man can learn anything, anywhere, from anybody. The word is late atar panui mine, God is everywhere, God's presence is everywhere. And therefore, wherever you turn, if you really want it, or if you love vodka, you can learn what there is to be learned. This actually is the guideline that I have taken for all of my tales, for all of my books. I have written 11 books. All of them deal sometimes with drunkards, but often with God. And my best characters are those who are drunk with God, who are mad in God. I adore madmen. I adore madmen because somehow I believe they contain a certain truth which today you cannot find in reality. Madmen, I speak of not clinical madmen naturally, of mystical madmen, of sacred madmen, are the poets of today. And if they are Jewish, then they are even better poets. I have written one book the first one, called Night, which although I wrote it as a, almost like a police report or a clinical report, I wanted it to be bare, austere. Not one word should be there that I could do without. In the beginning, the book had 800 pages. I cut it down to 160. All of my books in the beginning have hundreds and hundreds of pages, and then I cut them down to 120, 160. At most, the latest one on Hasidism has 280, but that's because my publisher likes big books. <laughs> I don't. I have written about the mad period of mankind, the Holocaust, about a period which I believe has still some bearing on our generation. I believe, in short, that whatever takes place today, everywhere, even in China, has somehow a relationship to the greatest event in history, the Holocaust. I believe the Holocaust to be even a greater event than the emergence of the State of Israel, or than any other state. For instance, Take the vocabulary today of the newspapers and you will see the vocabulary reminds you of 1939-45. Again, we speak of racism, again we speak of hunger, again we speak of indifference, again we speak of genocide, again there are wars and again we speak of nuclear holocaust. When young students in Paris want, want to insult the police, and what young student does not want to insult the police? The students call them Gestapo. They never saw a Gestapo in their lives. They were born afterwards. When we try to denounce the war in Vietnam, they compare it to Auschwitz. What in Los Angeles is compared to the Warsaw Ghetto? And I am sorry that it hurts me when I saw in a paper that a prominent writer, James Baldwin, compared Angela Davis to a Jewish woman going to Dachau or to Bergen-Belsen. I say I was hurt because there are certain comparisons that are not to be made. We don't make them and no one should. It is unfair to that Jewish woman who, who didn't come back and even unfair to Angela Davis I haven't met her, but I, I, I really think seriously that it's unfair to her because somehow she comes out as a caricature, as a farce in this. There is no comparison, not with regard to, to these events that I try to describe. Well, to feed you more questions, I have written other books about Soviet Russia. I have written a book called The Jews of Silence, trying to bring back not the fear and not only the fear, and not only the, the suffering, but the hope, and the song, and the beauty, and the ecstasy of tens and tens of thousands of young Jews in Russia who 
one day out of the blue surprised and astonished the entire world and even us by claiming kinship with their people, meaning the people of Israel, by claiming kinship with their faith, the faith of Israel, although they knew nothing about either. So I described the dancing and the singing, a kind of, of Woodstock that takes place in Russia every Simchat Torah. Then I have written a novel, a very strange novel, a mystical novel called A Beggar in Jerusalem, which some people in the beginning, without reading it, were convinced it's about the United Jewish Appeal. <laughs> <laughs> but it is not. Why beggars? Because then we were all beggars. In 67, we were all beggars. In 67, when I remember I was in France, and I came then to New York in May, and I went day after day to the United Nations, and I listened to the speeches, so many speeches, so poisonous, so full of hate, and one one speaker after the other went up and said it openly, we are going to exterminate the state of Israel. And there was not one delegate to get up and say, gentlemen, what are you talking about? So I had a feeling then that the cycle is being reopened. And once again, we shall enter the Holocaust, one generation after. I must confess to you, I was convinced that Israel will lose the war. See, I am not a general. And I have not this confidence that they have. I am a simple Jew from the diaspora with my fears and my complexes, my inhibitions, and my knowledge. And all the signs were there. I had a feeling that it starts all over again. The same words, and words have their own dynamic, have their own mystery. So we were beggars, and when we came to Jerusalem, I came there during the war, and we were all rushing to the wall, and I saw them crying, and they cried like children. All these tough paratroopers uh, cried like children. I was moved, terribly moved, and I saw myself as a child again. And therefore, to that child, I wrote A Beggar in Jerusalem. I also called the title A Beggar because the place where I come from, Siget, that is probably the only thing correct in the biography that you read. <laughs> <laughs> Even that isn't correct because it changed names so often. In my town, we were 15,000 Jews and all were chased out, deported. Very few came back, 50 came back. But somehow, there is something in Jewish history which is called to life. I often think about it. There are no more Jews in Siget, there are no more Jews in Lizensk, no more Jews in Berdichev, all these little capitals of the Hasidic kingdom, which became so famous that they are on our lips. Uh, when you read a Hasidic book, you would think that Kotsk, because Kotsk was so important in Hasidism, and because the Rabbi of Kotsk was such a great man, and he had so many followers, you would think that Kotsk must have been a capital like Paris, at least. Or Los Angeles, which is more than Paris. Kotsk was a small village, 1,300 inhabitants. But in our kingdom, we somehow immortalized it. We glorified it. And Kotsk is really in Hasidism more famous than Paris, because believe me, when I was a Hasid in my hometown, I never heard the name Los Angeles but I knew what Kotsk is. So what happened really? Something really strange happened, that our enemies, and there were many, managed to wipe out all these cities. There are no more Jews in Kotsk, no more Jews in Pshischa, in Berdichev, and Siget, and Satmar, no more Jews there. But what did we do? We brought all these capitals with us everywhere. We moved them. You, today, when you say Satmar to a Hasid, he does not think about the Satmar which is in Transylvania in Europe. Satmar today is Brooklyn. When you say of Siget, 
Sigat is not really between the Carpathian Mountains from where I come. Sigat is Brooklyn, Williamsburg. Lubavitch is in the Ukraine, Khazv Khalila. <laughs> Lubavitch is, in, is again, is, is 770 Eastern Parkway. We have managed to bring the geography around and bring it with us. Except we managed to reconstruct Jewish life everywhere. They wiped out the Hasidim, we have new Hasidim. They killed the masters, we have other masters, not many, not as great, but we have masters. They destroyed the schools, we have new schools. Everything is being recreated, except one type disappeared totally from our stage, and that is the beggar. And when I say beggar, I mean a real beggar. I don't say, I don't refer to the uh, professional fundraisers, you know, when they, c they call on the telephone, how much do you give, you know. I mean a real beggar. There was something so beautiful about, something so moving. There, their humility and their arrogance at the same time. If you didn't give the beggar in a certain manner, he was insulted. And he said, then if you are not mending your ways, I won't accept anymore. He did you a favor. <laughs> and there was, there was something so mystical, maybe because I was a child, there was something so mysterious. They all came, they were wandering storytellers. And I learned more from those beggars than from all the other people including my teachers in the Sorbonne. As a child, because I had a Hasidic upbringing, I even suspected that each beggar is a prince in disguise. And now I know that it is true. Therefore, I brought back the beggars. I gave them a roof, a haven, an address, in my own little universe, which was my novel, A Beggar in Jerusalem. Then I wrote some other books, and the latest one is Souls on Fire, about Hasidic masters. Um, in the beginning, I write in French. Don't ask me why, <laughs> because I'll tell you. <laughs> um, I write in French, and in French I called it une célébration chassidique, which is much nicer, much simpler, a chassidic celebration, which is much truer to the chassidic tradition, a fabrengen, a mesiba. But, you know, American publishers have their own way. And because someone wrote a book, Souls on Ice, and he was not Jewish, <laughs> the publisher decided, well, Jew one Jew must write a book, Souls on Fire. And it happened to be me. Uh, <laughs> although there is no relationship between the two. But in retrospect, I was not so sorry, because truly, truly, Hasidism is precisely that. Hasidism was a beautiful adventure, the beautiful tale of the tale. It was the soul of the soul. And all these souls were on fire. The difference between a Hasid we know, or a Hasidic master, and and other master, like the Gaon of Vilna, we were told in, in our tradition is that the Baal Shem, the master of the good name, the one who founded the movement, left no books when he died. He only left people. While his opponent, the Gaon of Vilna, who was the greatest Talmudist of ten generations, when he died, he left many books, important books, immortal books, but no people. So Hasidism really is a tale for people, about people, extraordinary people, and ordinary people. Something in Hasidism made the ordinary extraordinary. It made every day into Shabbat. It made really every beggar into a storyteller and into a prince. So all the questions that you will have to ask, you will want to ask, unless you prefer me telling stories, which I prefer, will come after one closing remark. Why do we write today? I do not write to entertain. I do not, not write to amuse. 
I come from a tradition which believes in the written word very much. I believe that words are dangerous and can be made into dangerous tools. I believe that words can become links too. It all depends what you do with them. As another writer before my time, the King Solomon would say, Life and death is really on what you say. And we in our generation, more than all the others before, knew how true that was, that life and death are actually related to the word, to language. What was so evil in the years of the Holocaust, and it was evil, was that Hitler wrote a book, expressed his ideas, and he believed in them. He believed in them with all his heart, with his mind, with his passion, with his madness. And in his writings he openly said, I'm going to destroy the Jews, I'm going to invade France, I'm going to destroy the others, all the subhumans. He believed in what he said, although no one in the world did. On the other side we had Le Havdil, I make that separation, Franklin Roosevelt. And I say that they have deal, no comparison, except chronologically, because they lived at the same time, and they were adversaries. On the other side, Roosevelt wrote very beautiful things about Jews and said very beautiful things about man against fear, and he spoke for liberties, but he himself didn't believe in what he said. For we now know that in 3944, the American government was guilty, terribly guilty, of complicity with what was going on in, in, in Europe. Beginning 42, the American government, now we know it, the documents are here, even public, they are made public. They knew what the Germans did, they knew the names, they knew the data, they knew the plans, everything was known. And Roosevelt went on proclaiming his fate in man and mankind, promising victories for man and mankind, and reassuring the Jews, and we all believed him, although he did not believe his own words. So everything can be related to language. I relate everything to my own, naturally. So let me end the way I began. How does one write a book? Maybe there are some students here who, who, who try to write literature. I'll give them an advice. Free. In the beginning you have at least ten ideas. If you have none, don't write. What do you do? You discard nine, you keep one. Must be concentrated, dense. For each idea, you have at least ten dramatic situations. If you are a writer, you discard nine, you keep one. For each situation, you have at least ten characters. They all want to enter there, to find their tikkun. You discard seven, and you keep three if you are a romantic. <laughs> <laughs> if not, you keep two, <laughs> or one. For each character you have who speaks or thinks, for each word you have five words. If you are a good writer, you discard four, you keep one. And so forth after a series of eliminations of a process of, this of selections, and poetry and literature is actually a process of selectivity. When all has been done, when the 800 pages are being cut to 180, you think the child is born. And then, you think you can sleep at night, but no. At night, all the heroes that you have humiliated, and all the words that you have discarded, and all the situations that you did not use, they come back and they nudge you. <laughs> <laughs> Which explains why writers usually sleep very badly. Well, I'm very conscious of time, we have 20 more minutes. You may 
ask me anything you want and I promise you to try to tell you a story for each question. Did you hear the question? The argument, said the gentleman, was presented that after the Holocaust it is impossible to believe in a God who cares, right? And you would like my reaction. I, I adore Kafka. I really believe in Kafka. He was one of the writers who cut my life and I think many lives. There is always in every writer's life a pre-Kafka period and a post-Kafka period. Kafka said, among others, something beautiful which I take for myself as a principle. He said, man is not capable of talking about God. Man, if at all, can try to speak to God. In my own terms, I would tell you that the question is a very good question, really, and I have tried to struggle with it in all of my writings. I have not answered it, uh, despite the appearances. I, I have no answer in general, but I have this particular one I have never answered. Somehow, I never speak about my relationship to God, because whatever I would say, willingly or unwillingly, could be a lie. If I say that I accept, it would be a lie. And if I say I reject, it would also be a lie. And as I said before, I mean it. I, I really would hate to make my words lie. But the question is a very strong question. So I'll tell you a story, as promised. <laughs> a Hasidic rabbi again, you know. I'm it is not because I have just written on Hasidism, also, but I have always loved Hasidic tales. A great Hasidic master, and they all were great, Rabbi Pinchas of Koritz, who was the companion and the disciple, a Talmud Haver, as we call, of the Baal Shem, one day received a visit of a young student, and he said, Rabbi, you must help me. You must help me because I have problems, I have doubts. I have so many doubts that I cannot go on living, I cannot go on studying, I cannot go on meeting people. These doubts are paralyzing me. I don't feel at ease in this world or in my own being. What can I do? And you know, when a Hasid has no answer, he tells a story. <laughs> so the Rabbi Pinchas of Korit said, my young friend, when I was your age, I had exactly the same problem. And for weeks and months, with no end, I had doubts, serious doubts, about God and his creation, about God and man, about scharbe onesh, meaning reward and punishment, about the justice imminent and transcendent. And I tried everything, but I couldn't. I tried fasting. I tried silence. I tried mortification. I tried study, I tried prayer, it didn't work. I couldn't even study. I was always on the same page, on the same book in the Talmud. Always. I couldn't go on. One day I heard that Israel Baal Shem Tov came into town. I never met him, so I went to see him. And I came into the shtibble, into the little locale where he was praying with his disciples, and he was just praying the Amidah, the silent prayer. And at one point, he finished the prayer, he turned around, and he saw me, and he saw everybody. But I thought he saw only me, and everybody else thought he saw only him. He didn't say a word, but for me it was enough. I went back to my home, to my room, I opened the Talmud. You see, said Rabbi Pinchas of Koritz to his disciple, the questions remained questions but I could continue. No. I cannot hear you.
I will translate, don't worry. I never expected to hear a Hebrew question in UCLA. <laughs> the question was that I had written in one of my books, The Accident, that suffering is evil and men should not give out suffering to others because suffering does not lead to purity. So what are we to do with our suffering? More or less, in the English translation, this is what the gentleman tried to ask. It's a very good and poignant question, because this is the problem that the Jewish people had faced, and men today, not only Jews, are facing all the time. Anyone who suffers faces that problem. What are we to do with the suffering? Number one, we must distinguish between chosen suffering and the one that was not chosen, it was inflicted upon us. To choose suffering, of course, is to respond to a sick, ascetic and masochistic inclination in man. And that is absolutely not Jewish. There isn't a single trace in, in our traditional Judaism <coughs> to show that the Jews have wanted to suffer. We had never chosen it. That was a Christian idea about Jews. That means the good Christians. The bad ones simply made us suffer. <laughs> However, once the suffering which is inflicted upon us is in us, what are we to do with it? Again, I have not resolved the problem totally. Uh, I have tried to write books about it, but here I think I failed. In my own mind, I hope, I had hoped, that all of my writings except night are joyful books are books of hope, truly. I, sp I don't know why, when people come and they say I was so sad reading The Gates of the Forest or The Town Beyond the Wall, I'm amazed and I'm, I'm sad because I had wanted to do just the opposite, to show the uplifting quality of certain events, rather that we can take these events and they were sad and uplift men because of them, because there is no other choice. I believe that this is what distinguishes, really, the Jewish condition from other conditions, the Jewish fate from other destinies. We take suffering and we say we are not going to indulge in what the Orientalists call the karma to extend its power and its realm, but on the contrary, we'll stop it somewhere and we'll turn it into prayer into fervor, or at least into literature. You really <laughs> found the question. <laughs> what is more important was the question, the painful question, Aliyah to Israel or the Diaspora. I hope you will forgive me if I will not, again, I will not answer you. I couldn't even tell you a story about it. Because I'll tell you why. I am not an Israeli. I am identified with the Diaspora. However, when I come to Israel, I feel something in me. There isn't a single place in earth, on earth where I feel the same thing. When I came to Jerusalem for the first time, it was not yet the real Jerusalem. I had the feeling I had been there already. And that is only in Jerusalem. I learned to pronounce the name Jerusalem before I learned to pronounce the name of my town where I was born. 
So of course I am very, very much there, but yet I am here, but I must tell you I don't feel good about it. That doesn't mean I shall go tomorrow to live in Israel. I go there, I belong to these crises Jews, or maybe you call them luxury Jews. I go there only when there is a crisis. Uh, if Israel is at war, I go. Not that I can help, but simply to allay my own bad conscience, I go. However, I imagine you asked the question because there are young people who have the same problem. I would never send any young Jew who comes, if he chooses, for advice to Israel. Because I have no right to do so, since I am not an Israeli. However, if he chooses to stay, I would tell him, if you have to stay here and help your own communities, it's important, if you think it is, and go on. But don't feel good about it. I think we are approaching the end. Let me finish with this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there? <laughs> I don't know. I hope not. I hope not. A cure to being a writer? That's the answer, yes. But afterwards were writers. I am not a Balshemto. <laughs> Rabbi Mendel of Kotsk. Rabbi Mendel of Kotsk, as I told you, was the great, 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 really the great character in Hasidism, both as a teacher and as a master, as an example. And he, before he died, he called in his few close friends and he said, Hersh, before I die, I want you to burn everything. Everything. The slightest note you will find, the last line, burn it into fire. He didn't want to leave writing or books after him. He told even why. He said, imagine I would write a book and publish it. Who would read me? Scholars don't need my book. Uh, professors, they think they know more than I. Who would read my book? A poor peasant Jew who works all week and he thinks he needs my commentaries on the Bible or on Talmud. But he, he works too hard all week. When can he read? On Shabbat. Friday evening, he's so tired from Friday, he goes to sleep immediately. Shabbat morning, he goes to the synagogue. When he comes back from the synagogue, he makes kiddush and he drinks a little bit of wine and he eats and after he eats, he finally has a few hours in before him. So he lies down on the sofa. And then he says, it would be a good idea to take a book. And he takes my book. And he begins to read one page. But then, you see, he's so tired from all week. And he has eaten so much that he falls asleep and the book falls on the ground. Tell me, for him, and for that, I should write a book? Yet, he tried to write a book like the entire school of Pshische to which he belonged. They all the three masters, Rabbi Bunem, the Yita Kodesh, and Mendel of Kotz, tried to write a book, a definitive book, called Sefer HaAdam, the Book of Men, in which they wanted to say everything that can be said about men. But they wanted the book to be one page and they burned it.